Hassan began to attract young men from the surrounding countryside between the ages of 12 and 20, particularly those whom he marked out as possible material for the production of killers. And every day he held court, a reception at which he spoke of the delights of paradise, and at certain times he caused drops of a soporific nature to be administered to ten or sometimes a dozen youths. And when half dead with sleep, drugged out of their minds, he had them conveyed to the several places and apartments of the garden. Upon awakening from the state of lethargy, their senses were struck by all the delightful objects, and each perceiving himself surrounded by lovely damsels, singing, playing, and attracting his regards by the most fascinating caresses, serving him also with delicious viands and exquisite wines, until, intoxicated with excess and enjoyment, amidst actual, actual, real rivers of milk and wine, he believed himself assuredly in paradise, and felt an unwillingness to relinquish its delights. When four or five days had thus been passed, they were thrown once more into a state of somnolency, drugged and carried out of the garden. Then, upon being carried to his presence and questioned by him as to where they had been, their answer was, In paradise, through the favor of your highness. And then, before the whole court who listened to them with eager astonishment and curiosity, they gave a circumstantial account of the scenes to which they had been witnesses. The chief, thereupon addressing them, said, quote, we have the assurance of our prophet that he who defends his Lord shall inherit paradise. And if you show yourselves, if you show yourselves to be devoted to the obedience of my orders, that happy lot awaits you. Unquote. Now, suicide was at first attempted by some to be able to return to the paradise that they had just left, not knowing that it was an illusion. But the survivors were early told that only death in the obedience of Hassan's orders could give the key to paradise. In the 11th century, it was not only credulous Persian peasants who would have believed such things were true. Even among the more sophisticated people, the reality of the gardens and auries of paradise were completely accepted. True, a good many Sufis preached that the garden was allegorical but that still left more than a few people who believed that they could trust the evidence of their senses. The ancient art of imposture by Abdul Rahman of Damascus gives away another trick of Hassan's. You see, he had a deep, narrow pit sunk into the floor of his audience chamber. One of his disciples stood in this in such a way that his head and neck alone were visible above the floor and around the neck was placed a circular dish in two pieces which fitted together with a hole in the middle. And this gave the impression that there was a severed head on a metal plate standing on the floor. Now, in order to make the scene more plausible, if that is the word, Hassan had some fresh blood poured around the head on the plate. Then the recruits were brought in, the initiates. Tell them commanded the chief, what thou hast seen. Then the disciple, appearing as a head on the plate, described the delights of paradise. Quote, you have seen the head of a man who died, whom you all knew. I have reanimated him to speak with his own tongue, unquote. And then he would really sever treacherously the man's head in real earnest and stuck for some time somewhere that the faithful would see it. And the effect of this conjuring trick, plus murder, increased the enthusiasm for martyrdom to the required degree and gave him unbelievable control over his flock. There are many documented instances of the recklessness of the Fidayim, devotees of the Ismailis, one witness being a Westerner who was treated a century later to a similar spectacle to that which had appalled the envoy of Malik Shah. Henry, Count of Champagne, reports that he was traveling in 1194 through Ismaili territory. 
Quote, the chief sent some persons to salute him and beg that on his return he would stop at and partake of the hospitality of the castle. The count accepted the invitation. As he returned, the Dai al Kibir, our great missionary, advanced to meet him, showed him every mark of honor, and let him view his castle and fortresses. Having passed through several, they came at length to one of the towers which rose to an exceeding height. On each tower stood two sentinels clad in white. These, said the chief, pointing to them, obey me far better than the subjects of your Christians obey their lords. And at a given signal, two of them flung themselves down and were dashed to pieces. If you wish, said he to the astonished count, all my white ones shall do the same. The benevolent count shrank from the proposal and candidly avowed that no Christian prince could presume to look for such obedience from his subjects. When he was departing with many valuable presents, the chief said to him meaningly, By means of these trusty servants, I get rid of the enemies of our society. Unquote. Now, further details of the mentality of Hassan are given in what is supposed to be an autobiographical account of his early days. And it probably is, in fact, such because the method of his conversion does seem to follow the pattern which has been observed in fanatics of whatever religious or political persuasion. He was, he says, reared in the belief of the divine right of the imams by his father. He early met an Ismaili missionary, Emir Dareb, with whom he argued strenuously against the emir's particular form of the creed. Then, some time later, he went through a bout of severe illness in which he feared to die and began to think that the Ismaili doctrine might really be the road to redemption in paradise. If he died unconverted, he might be damned. Thus it was that as soon as he recovered, he sought out another Ismaili propagandist, Abu Najam, and then others. Eventually, he went to Egypt to study the creed at its headquarters. He was received with honor by the caliph due to his former position at the court of Malik Shah. In order to increase their own importance, the high officials of the court made a good deal of public play of the significance of the new convert, but this fact seemed in the end to help Hassan more than it did them. He entered into political intrigue and was arrested, then confined in a fortress. No sooner had he entered the prison than a minaret collapsed, and in some unexplained way this was interpreted as an omen that Hassan was in reality a divinely protected person. The caliph, hurriedly making Hassan a number of valuable gifts, had him put aboard a ship sailing for northwest Africa. This gave him the funds which he was to use for setting up his paradise. And also, through some quirk of fate, the disciples whom he sought. A tremendous storm blew up, terrifying the captain, crew, and passengers alike. Prayers were held, and Hassan was asked to join. He refused. Quote, the storm is my doing. How can I pray that it abate? Unquote, he asked. And then says this, quote, I have indicated the displeasure of the Almighty. If we sink, I shall not die, for I am immortal. If you want to be saved, believe in me, and I shall subdue the winds, unquote. Well, at first, the offer was not accepted. Presently, however, when the ship seemed on the point of capsizing, the desperate passengers came to him and swore eternal allegiance. Hassan was still very calm and continued so until the storm abated. The ship was then driven on to the seacoast of Syria, where Hassan disembarked together with two of the merchant passengers who became his first real disciples. Hassan was not yet ready for the fulfillment of his destiny as he saw it for the time being. He was traveling under the guise of a missionary of the Caliph in Cairo. From Aleppo, he went to Baghdad, seeking a headquarters where he should be safe from interference and where he yet could become powerful enough to expand. Into Persia, the road led him, traveling through the country, making converts to his ideas, which were still apparently strongly based upon the secret doctrines of the Egyptian Ishmaelis. Everywhere, he created a really devoted disciple, Arfidei, he bade him stay and try to enlarge the circle of his followers. 
These circles became hatching grounds for the production of self-sacrificers. The initiates, who were drawn from the ranks of the most promising ordinary converts, Thus it was that miniature training centers modeled upon the abode of learning were in being within a very few months of his return to his homeland. During his travels, a trusted lieutenant, one Hussein Kahini, reported that the Iraqi district where the fortress of al was situated seemed to be an ideal place for proselytism. Most of the ordinary people of that place, in fact, had been persuaded into the Ismaili way of thinking. The only obstacle was the government. Ali Mahdi, who looked upon the Caliph of Baghdad as his spiritual and temporal lord. The first converts were expelled from the country. But before many months, however, there were so many Ismailis among the populace that the governor was compelled to allow them to return. Hassan, though he would not brook, would not allow him. The prospective owner of Alamut decided to try a trick. He offered the governor 3,000 pieces of gold for the amount of land which could be encompassed by the hide of an ox. When Mahdi agreed to such a sale, Hassan produced a skin, cut it into the thinnest possible thongs, and joined them together to form a string which encompassed the castle of Alamut. Although the governor refused to honor any such bargain, Hassan produced an order from a very highly placed official of the Seljuk rulers, ordering that the fortress be handed over to Hassan for 3,000 gold pieces. Well, it turned out that this official was himself a secret follower of the Sheik of the Mountain. The year was A.D. 1090. Hassan was now ready for the next part of his plan. He attacked and routed the troops of the emir who had been placed in the governorship of the province and wielded the people of the surrounding districts into a firm band of diligent and trustworthy workers and soldiers answerable to him and him alone. Within two years, the vizier Nazim al-Mulk had been stabbed to the heart by an assassin sent by Hassan, and the emperor Malik Shah, who dared to send troops against him, died in grave suspicion of poison. Hassan's revenge upon his class fellow was to make him the very first target of his reign of terror. You see, with the king's death, the whole realm was split up into warring factions. For long, the assassins alone retained their cohesion. In under a decade, they had made themselves masters of all Persian Iraq and of many forts throughout the empire. This they did by forays, direct attack, the poisoned dagger, and in any other manner which seemed expedient indeed, the ends always justified the means. The Orthodox religious leaders pronounced one interdict after another against their doctrines, all to no effect. By now, the entire loyalty of the Ismailis under him had been transferred from the Caliph to the personality of the Sheikh of the Mountain, who became the terror of every prince in that part of Asia, the Crusader chiefs included. Despite and despising fatigues, dangers, and tortures, the assassins joyfully gave their lives whenever it pleased the great master who required them either to protect himself or to carry out his mandates of death. The victim, having been pointed out, the faithful, clothed in a white tunic with a red sash, the colors of innocence and blood, went on their mission without being deterred by distance or danger. Having found the person they sought, they awaited the favorable moment for slaying him, and their daggers very seldom ever missed their aim. Richard the Lionheart was at one time accused of having asked the Lord of the Mountain to have Conrad of Montferrat killed, a plot which was carried out thus, quote, Two assassins allowed themselves to be baptized, and placing themselves beside him seemed intent only on praying. But the favorable opportunity presented itself. They stabbed him, and one took refuge in the church. 
But hearing that the prince had been carried off still alive, he again forced himself into Montferrat's presence and stabbed him a second time and then expired without a complaint amidst refined tortures, unquote. You see the method of controlling men's minds that Hassan had perfected was extremely effective and powerful. And not one, not even one incident of one of his followers failing to carry out his orders exactly can be found. The order of the assassins had perfected their method of securing the loyalty of human beings to an extent and on a scale which has seldom been paralleled. The assassins carried on the battle on two fronts. You see, they fought whichever side in the crusade served their purposes. They fought with the Knights Templar, and they fought against the Knights Templars. At the same time, they continued the struggle against the Persians. The son and successor of Nizam al-Mulk was laid low by an assassin dagger. The sultan who had succeeded his father, Malik Shah, and gained power over most of his territories, was marching against them. One morning, however, he woke with an assassin weapon stuck neatly into the ground near his head. Within it was a note warning him to call off the proposed siege of Alamut. Well, he came to terms with the assassins after that. Powerful ruler, though he undoubtedly was. You see, the assassins eventually had what amounted to a free hand in exchange for a pact by which they promised to reduce their military power. It was during their pacts, their treaties, their battles with the Knights Templars, that many, some say most, some few even say all, of the Knights Templars were initiated into the mysteries. Hassan lived for 34 years after his acquisition of Alamut. On only two occasions since then had he even left his room. Yet he ruled an invisible empire as great and as fearsome as any man before or since, they say. But his empire may still exist today, changed and melded with other sects of the mysteries. Hassan seemed to realize that death was almost upon him and calmly began to make plans for the perpetual continuance, folks, of the order of the assassins. And we now begin the latter days of the assassins, which we will not finish in this hour, but will finish in the next. The ruler of one of the most terrifying organizations the world has ever known was without a lineal successor. In fact, he had had both of his sons killed, one for carrying out an unauthorized murder and the other for drinking wine. Certainly a case of do as I say, not as I do. He called his two most trusted lieutenants from the strongholds which they maintained on his behalf, Kia Buzurg Umid, Kia of Great Promise, and Abu Ali of Quazwin. Kia was to inherit the spiritual and mystical aspect, while Abu Ali attended to the military and administrative affairs of the order. It is said that Hassan bin Sabah died almost immediately afterwards, in 1124, at 90 years of age, having given the world a new word, assassin. Assassin in Arabic signifies guardians, and some commentators have considered this to be the true origin of the word guardians of the secrets, which the Knights Templar took to Europe. The organization of the order under Hassan called for missionaries, friends who were disciples and Fedavi's devotees. The last group had been added by Hassan to the Ismaili original, and these were the trained killers. Fedavi's wore white with a girdle cap or boots of red. In addition to careful coaching in where and when to place the dagger in the victim's bosom, they were trained in such things as languages the dress and manners of monks, merchants, and soldiers, any of whom they were ready to impersonate in carrying out their mission. The chief was known as Sayedna, which means our prince, or leader, and popularly because of the mountain stronghold of Alamut, as the Sheik of the Mountain. 
Now, Alamut, or the stronghold on the mountain, was also known as the Eagle's Nest. And this is what Hitler named his mountain retreat. And there's also an Eagle's Nest near Santa Barbara, California, which very few people know anything about yet. Now, the Sheik of the Mountain is the figure referred to in Crusaders' writings as Sidney, or Sinex di Monte, the first word being a literal translation of the word peer, Persian for ancient or sage. There were three great missionaries who ruled three territories. After the friends and feet of ease came to the Lazic aspirants who were being trained for membership of the society but were as yet uninitiated, the Hassan reduced the original number of degrees of initiation from nine to the mystical number of seven. A similar number of regulations formed the rules of the order. This, in fact, comprised the working plan of the spreading of the faith. The first rule was that the missionary must know human psychology in such a way as to be able to select suitable people for admission to the cult and was summed up in the mnemonic, quote, cast no seed upon rocks, unquote. The second rule of procedure was the application of flattery and gaining the confidence of the prospective member. Third came the casting of doubt into the mind by superior knowledge. Fourthly, the teacher must apply an oath to the student never to betray any of the truths which were to be revealed to him. Now he was told at the fifth stage that Ishmaelism was a powerful secret organization supported by some of the most important figures of the time. After this, the aspirant was questioned and studied to discover whether he had absorbed the opinions of the teacher and attached himself sufficiently into a position of dependence upon his ideas. And at this stage, he was asked to meditate upon the meaning of the reported saying of the prophet that, quote, Paradise lies in the shadow of swords, unquote. In the final degree, many difficult passages of the Quran were explained in terms of allegory. How is it that the rules of this extraordinarily successful order are known in such detail? Well, it so happened that when the Mongols eventually overthrew Alamut by force of arms, their chief, Halaku, meaning destruction, Khan, Ask his chief minister to examine their library. This most learned man, father of kings, Giovanni, later wrote a careful book in which he detailed the organization of the assassins whose name he attributed to the use of the drug hashish, which they were said to use in stupefying candidates for the ephemeral visit to paradise. It is possible that recruits were made in another way than by selecting gullible, fully grown youths Legend has it that Hassan, once master of Alamut, used to buy unwanted children from their parents and train them in implicit obedience and with the sole desire to die in his service. Buzer Umid, meaning great promise, the second grand master, grand master is still used today, folks, maintained the power of the assassins on much the same pattern. Building new forts, gaining fresh converts, terrorizing those whom he did not want to have killed and using them to further his design of world conquest. Sultan Sanjar of Persia, in spite of several expeditions against the viper's nest, as al was now being called, could do little about him. Viper's nest was the term given by the assassin's enemies. The assassins themselves called it the eagle's nest. Ambassadors on each side were slain. A notable religious leader was captured by the assassins, given a mock trial, and flung into a furnace. The Grand Master, at this time, seldom put on the field more than 2,000 men at a time. But it must be remembered that they were killers, acting under an iron discipline, and more than a match for any organized army that they might ever have to face. Now the order began to spread in Syria, where the continued contact with the Crusaders was established. The warriors of the cross were in fairly effective control of an area extending from the Egyptian border to Armenia in the north. 
Bahram, a Persian leader of the assassin cult from Astrabad, gained control of a mighty fortress in Syria in the region known as the Valley of Demons. Wadi al-Jan, and from there spread out from one fort to another. The Grand Prior, Bahram, now moved to an even more substantial fortified place, Masyat. Bahram's successor, Ishmael, the lash bearer, planted a trained devotee on the saintly vizier of Baghdad, into whose confidence he worked his way to such an extent that this assassin, now called the Father of Trust, was actually made Grand Judge of Baghdad. The Crusaders had by now been about 30 years in the Holy Land, and the assassins decided that they could usefully form an alliance with them aimed against Baghdad. A secret treaty was therefore made between the Grand Master and Baldwin II, King of Jerusalem, whereby the Ishmaeli Grand Judge would have opened the gates of Baghdad treacherously to the Crusaders if the fortified city of Tyre were handed over to the assassins for their part in the transaction. Well... As with most plans, something went wrong. The judge had ordered an underling to open the city gates. And this service had told the military commander of Damascus, who lost no time in killing the man, the vigier, and 6,000 people believed to be secret assassins within the city. The Damascus garrison fell upon the crusaders and beat them back in a thunderstorm which the Christian warriors attributed to divine anger at their unworthy pact and the assassins as an attempt by the powers of nature to allow the crusaders in the city under its cover. Meanwhile, the Grand Master was indulging in an orgy of destruction of individual rulers who opposed his creed. The list is interminable, but this is a fair example Quote, the celebrated Aksankur, prince of Mosul, was a warrior equally dreaded by the Christians and the assassins. As this prince, on his return from Ma'ara Masrin, where the Muslim and Christian hosts had parted without venturing to engage, entered the mosque at Mosul to perform his devotions. He was attacked at the moment when he was about to take his usual seat by not one, but eight assassins, disguised as dervishes. Three of them fell below the blows of the valiant emir. But ere his people could come to his aid, he had received his death wound and expired, unquote. The fanaticism which inspired the killers was shared, it seemed, by other members of their families, who had been thoroughly trained in the bloody creed. For the historian Kamal Eldin relates, on this occasion when the mother of one of the youths who attempted Aksunkar's life Heard that he had been slain, she painted her face and donned the gayest raiment and ornaments, rejoicing that her son had been found worthy to die the glorious death of a martyr in the cause of the imam. But when she saw him return alive and unscathed, she cut off her hair and blackened her countenance and would not be comforted. Things thus continued for the 14 years and a quarter of the second Grand Master's rule when he died to nominate his son, Kia Muhammad, as his successor. Under Muhammad, the killings continued. A part of the seacoast of Palestine came into assassin hands, and the cult leaders reaffirmed their overly belief in orthodox Islam. In public, Ismailis were ordinary Muslims. The secret doctrine of the divinely guided leader was not to be discussed with the uninitiated. Don't miss tomorrow night's show. Good night, and God bless each and every one of you.